Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, just a show of hands, who's, for whom is this the first time that you're at a demo night? Oh, cool. So I'll explain a little bit about what Maker Square is and what demo night looks like. Um, Maker Square is a school. We teach people uh, how to program, and we help them find jobs after three weeks of really intense training. Um, demo night is the culmination of what students have been working on for the last three weeks. So they have three months of stuff that they learn, and the last three weeks of those three months is when they build projects that they show off tonight. Um, the way that the night works is they'll do three and a half minutes, like really fast, essentially like lightning talks of what they built, and uh, they'll just keep doing that. There's seven presentations, and then afterwards, they'll break off into like an adult science fair version, um, and they'll be standing around the room, and you can go ask them questions. So in the booklet that you have, um, somehow keep track of which groups that you want to go talk to afterwards for questions um, or anything. That's, that's kind of how the night's going to work. The presentations will run about 20-some minutes, about 25 minutes altogether. Um, and right afterwards, we'll go into a science fair portion. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where Maker Square students have gone. So these are the places where Maker Square students have gone. Um, where they're currently working. Um, all over town, all over uh, the country as well, um, in startups, in mid-sized companies, in enterprise companies, all over the place. Literally, Maker Square students of the past um, four classes have gone everywhere with dev teams of anywhere from two all the way up to hundreds. Um, so, it's really interesting. This isn't something that we anticipated when we started, but it's really cool to see that the stuff that they learn here is applicable all across the workplace. Um, and not only do they go to companies of different sizes, they also are working in different tech stacks, many, many different tech stacks. The Ruby stack, Microsoft plant means everywhere. Um, and this is just a quick preview of the type of jobs that people are currently working in which is an indicator of the type of jobs that people can get. Um, Ruby developer, front-end developer, software engineer, data analyst, UI developer, UX, C Sharp, .NET, specifically Ember, all over the place. Um, they go into many, many parts of the stack, and it's because of what they learn. Um, and even more so than what they learn, it's because of how fast they learn it. The real big takeaway for people that graduate from Maker Square is that they have learned how to learn things really quickly, which is a really valuable skill set for employers. Um, so even if they uh, graduate knowing a lot of Ruby and JavaScript, um, they're able to pick up many other languages very, very quickly, and that's how uh, they're successful in all these different positions that they've gotten in the past. Um, to speak more about the... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, before that. So if you're interested in talking to any of the um, graduates and you're wondering which graduates you should be talking to, um, because our graduates go work in all different sizes of dev, or dev teams as well as work in many different parts of the stack, um, we get to know them pretty well. So if you're interested in recommendations for who you should be interviewing for open positions, um, please email recruit at themakersquare.com, our career services team, raise your hand. Yeah, Jessica. <laughs> They're right in the two corners back there. Um, they'll be responding to you very quickly, and they'll be able to connect you with the right uh, candidates for whichever positions that you're looking for. So please get in touch with them if you're uh, interested in hiring. You can also get in touch with students directly um, if you'd like after you meet them tonight. Um, it's your call. However, uh, we're able to tell you who we think would be good for which positions um, instead of you kind of playing a guessing game. It's up to you, but if you email recruit at Makersquare, we'll get back to you pretty quickly. And to talk to a little bit more about the actual curriculum that we teach, um, I'm gonna have Gilbert come up. He's one of the lead instructors, and he's gonna take you through uh, the recent changes in our curriculum and um, also a little bit of the, the thinking behind the curriculum. Hello. Oh. <laughs> this thing's pretty sensitive. <laughs> Thank you again for coming. Uh, we really appreciate you guys coming out and taking the time to find out what Make Square is all about. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about the Maker Square curriculum. 
Now, over the past year, our curriculum has gotten much, much, much better. Better over, over and over and over. Every class has just been improved so much. We strive to have the highest quality curriculum we can possibly have for beginner and inter intermediate level programming. Now, that's a pretty big, it's a pretty big goal. So how, how do we achieve that? Well, we can do that by teaching the fundamental concepts that are required to become a good and well-rounded software developer. Now, to do this stuff, at Makersquare, we teach a ton of things, lots of things. But the overarching thing, overarching thing, is that we teach software design principles. Now, by show of hands, how many of you have been developing for a few years? All right, so you guys already understand the importance of software design. Without software design, your application becomes a complete mess. Features take longer to develop and depressing, and uh, <laughs> things become more depressing as you work on the app longer and longer. <laughs> so you don't want that. You want to avoid that. So to avoid that, you gotta learn this stuff. You gotta learn what all of this means, software design. At Makersquare, we do that by having an extremely project-heavy curriculum. The moment students walk into our door, they start coding, and they do not stop until they leave the course. For 12 weeks straight, all day, every day. With that, they are also employing test-driven development. We teach test-driven development from day one. Because of this, even though their code might be messy at first, because they have tests, they can easily and confidently refactor it as we teach more and more software design principles. So lastly, I want to talk to you about Ruby on Rails. Now many of you already know that we teach Ruby on Rails. However, it is not the way that you might think we teach it. We do not teach standard Rails. We teach how to use Rails completely decoupled from your application. In other words, students develop their application in plain Ruby, perhaps a database, and they get it all working before Rails even comes into the picture. Does that sound interesting? You should definitely talk to our students about it after the presentations. <laughs> and that's it, thank you for coming. And I hope you enjoy what our students have to show you. And we will get started with that in a minute. Thanks. Eight years. Uh, I, my wife and I both have been um, making a living as uh, uh, musicians, and um, uh, we've sort of we wanted to get this app built for a while. And uh, when I came to Maker Square, really, I just my expectation was to learn uh, who to hire or who not to hire. And um, but it was really far surpassed, and I actually was able to start building this app that we wanted to build for a while. Um, what it is, is it's a, uh, a, through our job, we sort of learned that uh, there's a lot of tools that broadcast radio is able to use that internet radio is not able to use. And what we wanted to do is build an app that um, brings those tools to internet radio. So. Um, here I've got uh, what it does when you log in, it makes a station based on your Twitter handle. And um, uh, in regular radio, 
you have uh, songs that are in heavy rotation, medium, and light rotation. And all songs go through this arc. Uh, they all start in light rotation, and they all go through this um, arc. The better songs go all the way up to heavy rotation. The terrible songs stop in light rotation. But they all go through this arc, and the arc is very important uh, because it's how you're introduced to new music. Um, inter internet radio and internet streaming sites do not necessarily have that arc. Uh, so what I want to do is build a site that automates that arc. Um, when you set up your station, you, um, you, you determine which songs are in heavy rotation, medium rotation, and light rotation, and it just um, creates a station where it, it distributes those songs uh, in the right frequency. Um, with commercials, which are awesome. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's the first part of it. The second part, um, and, and these are just a couple of the features that eventually I want to build out. Uh, the second part is voice tracking, which is what uh, radio stations use to make it sound like you're listening to live radio, even though you're almost never listening to live radio. I would say, I mean, I, I go visit stations every week, and I, I would say maybe 10 times we've been actually live. Um, which is great, because like when we're really live, all I can think is, don't say shit, don't say shit, don't say shit, don't say shit. <laughs> um, but the way they do that is they record, uh, they record everything. Um, oops, I got to allow the microphone to get used. Uh, they record everything um, as if they're live, and then at some point they stop it, and um, you hear as if they're live. I sound great. Uh, and then you can drag that into the playlist and it uploads it to the server and just plays it in the right spot so you know it sounds like a real radio station um, and that's about it that's uh, that's the app uh, I want to say anything that looks good here was done by Tony or harsh in about 30 seconds uh, and uh, the rest is me so, anyways, I'm not looking for a job, uh, but uh, because you know, I did pretty well in another industry and, and we got some money saved up, and I just want to see this thing through. So, uh, I'm not looking for a job, but I am looking for lots of advice. So, please come say hey, and uh, looking forward to it. And thank you to y'all for really, uh, I never would have expected to be able to uh, start something like this here. So, thanks a lot, y'all. Jose, and we built something called Fan Clash. Uh, Fan Clash is a daily fantasy sports app, and it allows users to go online and bet on sports. All right, so show you the app. My person ID. What we have here is ten players that we have drafted. These ten players are actually going to be playing tonight. The game is going to be the Spurs versus OKC. So we're going to select five players, one from each tier. Uh, tier one has Kevin Durant and Russell Westwood. We'll select Kevin Durant, and we'll do the same for the rest of the players. All right. Uh, now, when we choose all the players, we'll get this uh, pop-up saying that if we wish to continue. This is because uh, this game, to enter this game, costs uh, twenty dollars. So let's click yes. All right. So now we have a, our profile profile page. As you can see, there's our gravatar and our information and all the games the user has. Um, also, there's the amount of money in their account. Yes, in order to get those um, live uh, player stats, we are data scraping from cbssports.com, and we're using a gym called Noco Geary to do so, and this is how it displays on our site. And we can't really show you this right now. Uh, we can show you this at eight o'clock when the game starts, um, but we can't show you it right now, so. All right, um, of course, uh, in order to play games, we need money. So for this, we've implemented uh, Stripe, which is a payment system. Um, 
This is a great payment system that lets users deposit money in their accounts via credit card. Um, this was a great experience. We actually had a lot of fun with this, but it was really difficult to implement it because Stripe usually takes subscription payments or set price payments. So in order to customize it for the user to put the amount they want to, it was kind of difficult. So it took us a few days to manage it, but it was really rewarding and we learned a lot from it. And the last thing we want to share with y'all is that our um, our game is getting um, live um, the live points, and it also is checking to see if each game is finished. And each, if each game is finished, then it checks to see if a winner is there. And if a winner is there, it does pay them out. And so we use standard rails and Postgres for this, and um, you can come check out our game live. Um, and if you have any questions, come over and talk to us. And thanks for your time. My name is Sermat Bukhari. And my name is Ifu Andy Mecca, and today we'll be, talk we'll be talking about our app, Running Buddy. So, Running Buddy is an application that allows runners to safely and efficiently find other runners in their locality to run with. So, now my partner will guide you through the screen flow of a typical user experience. So, we're going to start with our landing page with Rocky for some inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> On the right, you can log in by clicking sign in with Facebook. Once you're logged in, you'll see the user dashboard. Essentially, the user dashboard, you'll see your user profile in the center. On the left, you'll see a menu box with different features to the, to the site that you can access different points of the site. Below that, you have a weather panel that pulls in the weather API to see the weather in your locality, so you can schedule your run. On the left, there's some stats about your run that you've run in the last three, three months or, or so. On the right, there's a video about proper running form and, and, and technique. We're going to go through a use case of actually posting a run at this point. Go ahead and do that. So some of the information that we're collecting that you want to post about the run that you want to make and you want other people to join is the date of the run, the time of the run, the location, the pace at which you run a mile. You don't want to run with people who run, if you're a seven minute mile, you don't want to run with someone who's an 11 minute mile, of course. Uh, minimum distance, your age or gender preferences if you have any, and maximum runners that you want joining your group. You don't want 50 people joining your group and slowing you down. So it'll take you back to this page where you can see your actual posts or runs. So the one we just posted was 7th Lavaca. Here you'll see at the bottom you can join the run, you can see the pace of that run, you can see the availability of this run, how many people can still join this run, and you'll also see that it's open to everyone, so both male and female runners can join this run. Lastly, we want to talk to you about running circles. Running circles are groups that you can join. So we just created some fake circles, Maker Square, Capital Factory, ThoughtBot, uh, ThoughtWorks. So you can join these groups and have some competitive spirit between these different groups, so your stats will compete. So that's our UI, now we're going to talk to you about our development process and the lessons that we learned. All right, so here you'll see a, a partial entity relationship diagram showing the relationship between um, various entities and our user. Uh, we found it was really important to engage in a lot of pre-planning uh, before we uh, started coding, coding so we could avoid any weird uh, things that would pop up later. So here's our tech stack. Uh, it's actually, uh, like Gilbert mentioned, uh, we, we learned to build uh, applications using Pure Ruby. So it's a Pure Ruby uh, application um, tested in RSpec. We did a lot of test-driven development, um, deployed with Rails. Um, the APIs we used are Mapbox to display the post information. Uh, we used uh, the Open Weather Map API to display weather, and we used OAuth because we realized uh, the vetting process was really crucial to making sure that users would actually want to use our app. Um, they're taking a big risk, you know, going out there and meeting up with complete strangers and going for a run. So they wanted to make sure that they felt safe doing so. So. Uh, some of the challenges we faced, like I mentioned before, user safety and security was really, really key. Um, and we did uh, run into some issues, uh, making sure that uh, <laughs> the uh, development environments across the team uh, were constant. Uh, we kept running across some errors uh, because they weren't. 
So some of the skills we learned uh, included both tech skills and soft skills. Among the tech skills was decoupled software design and we see, and we see software principles like, like uh, Gilbert mentioned. Tech fads will come and go, but programming principles and good software design are here to stay. We know that in, in industries, every six months there's a new framework coming out. So we were keen on not sticking on any particular framework or language, uh, but seeing what was needed for our application itself. Some of the soft skills, of course, included you know, communicating with your team early and often. Things will break. It's inevitable. It's really important to persevere through those, through those issues. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to visit us after the presentations. My partner's name is Brian Provost, and we're here today to present Title. Since we were both interested in education, we decided to create an application that counters the lack of personalized classwork and homework. Brian is now going to assign Period 1 Math, 10 problems from addition, and my fake son just got assigned some homework. <laughs> <laughs> Brian will now walk you through the student experience. Okay, so here we see our student, our Example students dashboard. Uh, it's the uh, beginning of summer school, so she's going to accept her invitation to her new history class. And uh, let's take a look at the assignment we just gave her. Uh, with this view, we wanted to create a way for students to practice concepts and for teachers to gather data on how well the, the students understand that. Uh, so really, the first challenge we faced was figuring out how to measure a student's proficiency in a subject. And um, did a lot of research on that, and uh, we'd be happy to talk more about it, but what we ultimately decided on was uh, taking all of a student's responses for a particular subject, uh, assigning each one a score between 1 and 4 for a correct response, and uh, negative 1 and 0 0.5 for an incorrect one, and then taking a weighted moving average of those, so more recent responses are weighted more heavily. Uh, our other concern here was making sure it was a somewhat enjoyable experience for the student while working on the problem. And uh, a big part of that is not having the page reload every time they submit a response. So uh, we decided to take that opportunity to just learn a new JavaScript framework for fun. Uh, we ultimately decided on Facebook's React uh, because it's one-way data binding sort of was a good fit for uh, what we were trying to accomplish here. Uh, and if part will go back to the student dashboard here, Looks like we are about to receive a chat message here. I'm just Looks like talk a little bit about that. Looks like we just received a chat. Um, so one of the problems we had right off the bat, incorporating a little message board, a live chat room for teachers and students, was incorporating WebSockets into a Rails application. Rails didn't really work well with concurrent threads when we deployed to DigitalOcean using Passenger and Nginx. So I, we actually decided to abstract out the the uh, WebSocket server deployed by its own and Heroku with, via Puma and, and Fay WebSockets. And actually on page load our uh, JavaScript forges a connection and just pings every 15 seconds to maintain the connection with the server. Um, we use Facebook React chat component to handle the incoming messages from the server. And the JSON objects have a classroom ID attribute. Based on that attribute, we feed them to the correct classroom view so that when the student clicks chat, it opens up the classroom that just received a message. I'll walk you through um, some of our teacher things. So the teachers can hover over each assignment, as, I, as you can see, see which students, which questions were marked as difficult most often. They can see how each student is doing. The dark pink indicates a student that has not completed the assignment on time. They can also search their students quickly um, using a struggling students only filter that pulls in the last five assignments, averages out the proficiency, and if they're still at a level one or level two, it marks them as struggling and they show up in the filter. So we had a lot of fun building this and we would love to talk about some of our features with you guys afterwards. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. 
Hello everyone, I'm Mariah Cattell, and these are my uh, teammates, Philip and Hubert. And our app is called the 100 Million Mile Challenge, which was, uh, we worked with a real life app, uh, client for our project. Um, the goal was to get children across the country to run 100 million miles for this next school year. And right now, we have thousands of schools participating in this right now, except they're actually doing this with pen and paper. And our active, uh, active schools came to us to build the online platform for schools to get easily just come on the website, log their miles, and compete with other schools across the nation. Um, for our tech stack, we use uh, Ruby on Rails, except we followed the single relationship principle. And I had everything decoupled in case our client wanted to make any up changes later on, upgrade uh, the, the, the Rails application. We use Postgres SQL for our, for our database, and then we use Bootstrap for our front end. We also use a lot of JavaScript, including uh, Mapbox and Leaflet for our, whenever a school signs up, it'll drop a pin on the map of the United States, and also it'll link you to their home page, so you can check it out. And then we also use D3 for data visualization. Um, Hubert's about, or Phil's about to walk you through the coach's uh, UI. Yeah, so I'm gonna pretend I am a coach and I'm going to sign in. We've already made an account for us. I've already signed us up as Hubert. Uh, our school is Keeling Middle School on the left. You can see that uh, we've had 2,000 miles and our goal is 5,000 for this and we're 40% there, which is automatic. And you can also check your national rank amongst other schools. You can see that you're only a couple hundred away from to overtake the second or the third rank. You can also check your city and state rank as well. And you can see that they're only a couple hundred away to overtake the second state rank, uh, which we're gonna do right now. We ran a lot of miles this week. Uh, we ran 3,200 miles with only 60 kids because we're training little Iron Man kids here at this school, Keeling. Uh, they've automatically earned the badge of 5,000 miles. You can check out some of the other badges, not just mile related, like how long they've been enrolled uh, and also that they've been uh, running, uh, that they signed up for the program in general. and the, that the ranks on the left side have automatically been updated as well. But it's not just as easy as running 100 million miles in a year. Uh, Hubert's gonna talk more about our development process. Hi, my name's Hubert, and I'm gonna talk about several interesting obstacles we faced over the course of building the app. The first is this was a client-proposed app, and that meant that the client was involved throughout the entire process with uh, scheduled weekly Skype meetings, constant feedback with the client liked and disliked, and as a result, accelerated changes to the code and specs according to the client's um, specifications. It was definitely difficult, but it was a great learning experience for all of us. Because we got a taste of what it was like to work on a real life web app with a project manager and thinking about potential uh, consumers. <clears throat> for instance, the client intended to customize an API for us to build with a directory of all the schools in the US. But unfortunately, there was a delay. In order to get the app built in time, we decided to take initiative on our own and find an API to use while we waited for the client's database. We also dealt with a lot of new JavaScript libraries we were unfamiliar, unfamiliar with, such as D3 for data visualization, which is responsible for the graph and the odometer animation on the school landing page that Philip just showed you. Uh, we also spent a great deal of time thinking about the general layout of the site to make sure that it would be appealing for middle school and elementary school kids, thinking about bright color palettes and dust floors. So on, uh, in total, it was a great pleasure to work on this app that would be hopefully get kids across the US exercising and establish healthy life, healthy goals, or healthy habits early on. And we're uh, the HMC group, and uh, thank you for everyone's time. Chris. Today we'll be presenting Style Me, which is a fashion app that we created together. It's based on a very simple concept. So basically, if you're walking on the streets and you see someone with a really cool t-shirt, boots, or bag, you simply take a picture of it, upload it onto Style Me, and then it, using um, CanFi, which is a technology, it'll analyze the photo and give you back the images that are similar to the one you just uploaded. 
So now Chris is going to give you um, a short run through of our technology that we use for front and back end development, and then give you a demo of our app. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a brief rundown of the tech stack. On the back end was fully tested, so we use RSpec for our testing. We use Rails as our deploy mechanism, our delivery mechanism. And for the front end, we use Scale.js, which is a lightweight front end framework to make our site more responsive. For the database, we use Postgres, and then we use Sidekick for background jobs. We use three different kinds of APIs, Amazon S3 for storage and image uploading, Amazon Product Market API for the search engine, and the app API that she just mentioned, which was the campfire API for our photo recognition. So this is a basic blueprint of our app. The important thing to take away from this is just the fact that we decouple Rails from the rest of our application. So now we're gonna give you a demonstration and a walkthrough of our application. This is the land of the This is the part of sign-in for the land sign -in. Sign in will take you to a personalized photo boost page. This gives us the option to upload a photo and to make our search, which is the biggest feature of our app. For the sake of time, we've actually prepared a video for you because the Can't Find API takes anywhere between five to 45 seconds to actually produce a result. So just for the sake of time, we've prepared this video, which will actually show you the results and what's supposed to happen after you upload a picture. So during this time, after we hit Submit and Match Me, it's actually running the response or the request to the campfire API in the background. This is where our psychic technology comes in. So we'll be running this in the background while the loading page is being rendered. This will produce the results page. Right here. Hovering over the results will give you a description and the overlay of each item. If we click through to each item, it'll take you to the, the website where you can actually purchase the item. So you click here, it takes us to Amazon.com, and we're able to purchase that item more. Another feature of our Photo Boost page is we're able to actually access Photo Boost from other search results from other users. For example, here, we can click in the here, and it give us a personalized portfolio page of another user, and we're able to see their results from their Photo Booth as well. These are the basic features of our app. Thank you for your time. I hope to speak with you afterwards. Brady. Uh, these are my partners Brandon, Mo, and Tony. And we chose to work on a project called Gear to Peer. Um, what Gear to Peer is, is an online shared economy uh, where users can both rent or rent out recreational equipment. Uh, we're strong believers in if you're only going to use something once, why buy it? So we thought that this would be a cool project. Um, what I'm going to do now is go ahead and walk you through a typical user experience here. So let's say that this weekend I want to rent a kayak to, for, to go out on Town Lake. I'll just type in kayak and click find it for Austin, Texas. Here it'll take me to available listings for this and I can see that there's plenty of kayaks available. I really like the look of this wooden kayak, only $22 a day. Um, here I can look through the pictures, everything looks good. Um, and so let's decide to uh, reserve it. I can put in some dates and click reserve this and a reservation will be sent to the user who actually has posted this listing. So the next time they log in, they'll actually see that I've requested this and they can check out my profile and decide to accept or reject my request. Um, as some other people have talked about and uh, Gilbert introduced, we built this app um, in a non-standard Rails app way. Um, we knew it would be important for uh, the app that would be large and that we'd be looking to grow because it would keep our code uh, decoupled and open to work with, add features. Um, and it really was uh, really easy for us to add features. We did so pretty late in the game uh, with no problems. Um, but we did run into 
a couple uh, difficulties as far as gems went. Um, one such was with image uploading. So, uh, is this too loud? No? Okay. Um, we're storing our images in an S3 instance, and um, before we push them to S3, we need to generate three different sizes of what the user is uploading. Um, so there's a handful of gems out there that make this pretty easy, but um, they all assume that you're using a traditional Rails application, and since we aren't, we had to build it out ourselves. Um, the hardest part of this was actually creating, um, mocking uh, file uploads from a user for testing purposes. Um, for that, we learned a lot about the file buffers. Also, um, for making our tests, for keeping our tests fast, we didn't want to push to S3 every time we were in our test suite. So we recorded HTTP responses and uh, stored them into YAML files and used those rather than pushing to S3 every time. So uh, Tony's going to talk to you about our user experience next. Uh, throughout the entire project, the user experience was very important because we have a lot of different entities with relationships to one another and a lot of attributes to display about them. Uh, so on the available listings, the listing page, and also the profile page specifically, uh, we had a lot of information to account for. Um, so a typical user of peer-to-peer -peer would likely need to view the listings that they post, uh, see any reviews associated with those listings, uh, reservations uh, that have come in from other users, uh, and then also uh, modify any sort of payment. Uh, we built this entire section using Ajax because we really liked the, uh, the single page experience of it. Um, we didn't want the user to have to wait for the page to refresh before getting their information. Um, and now Brandon is going to talk about payments. So with regard to payments and transactions, we were pretty strict about this because this is how we would make money initially, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, so we initially went with the Stripe API, and we built it out, got it working, and then realized that they didn't handle escrow. And our whole business model relies on that. So we ended up going with the Balanced API. It was pretty fun to work with. Um, the hardest part about this was testing. Again, we had to mock HTTP responses. And we also had to try catch errors so we could send the appropriate errors back to the user. Um, but in the end, we got it working, and we're really proud of this. So please come by afterwards. Thanks. And those are all the presentations for today. Um, we're going to get started with the side tour portion of things. So all of the graduates are going to go around the table to the side that you see. If you could really help us out and move the chairs up to this area, that would be great. Thanks for coming and say hi to them.